Welcome to the Brew Crew Review Podcast, the show by fans for fans of your Milwaukee Brewers. All right, Brewer fans, welcome to another episode of the Brewer Review Podcast. Um, we're joining me today. Uh, this is Craig, as uh, co-host Vince. Vince, how are you doing today? I'm great, Craig. How are you? Great. April is here. Spring is on the way uh, here in Wisconsin, and uh, the Brewers baseball is back, and uh, the Brewers have got out of the gates here for the 2023 season uh, in awesome fashion. They currently are 12 and five as of this taping um, in first place in the NL Central. And uh, I'm happy to say and report that the Cardinals are in dead last five games behind us. So uh, it's a good day. Yeah. I guess yeah, uh, it's exciting. What, what are your early? Yeah, I, I was say, there's not, there's not many uh, people that probably would have predicted that 10 or this many games in the season that we'd be being chased by the Cubs and Pirates uh, and that the Reds would also be ahead of St. Louis. No, absolutely. In fact, if I remember correctly, this uh, similarly talented red team that even had Joey Votto, I think this time last year, started off at some like horrific pace in April, <laughs> was losing uh, like yeah. an unbelievable amount of games. They did recover a little bit, but yeah, it's kind of surprising um, that um, especially uh, the Pirates have been playing really well. I mean, that's always surprising, but um, yeah, it's early. Um, and um there's a lot to talk about, but I guess let's let's start by saying what what's your take on um why is it so far that the Brewers um have been so successful early in April of this season? Well, uh, and I don't mean to jump ahead of uh Chad or Scotty here, but I I guess I'll go first. I, I think it's a combination of things. I, I really think that what has primarily changed has been some of the, the clubhouse chemistry. Um, I think that there was, as we've talked about a number, a number of times, um, that there was a real sour feeling in the clubhouse after the Josh Hader trade last August. We heard, you know, it's not often that, you know, we hear players speak out to the extent that they did. Um, after the Josh Hader trade, we heard, you know, publicly from Devin Williams and we heard from uh, Eric Lauer and we heard from, you know, a number of guys that talked about, how they felt like the front office wasn't behind the team and that some changes needed to be made. And those were very public concerns that weren't just shared with, you know, those of us that had press passes, it was something that was done on a larger scale. And I think that um, what you've seen this year is that a number of guys are new blood in the clubhouse. And that has been able to kind of shift that paradigm away from that uh, 2022 mentality and, and do something that Craig council talked about quite a bit, which is to create a new story for a different season. So you know, guys like Bryce Terang and Joey Weimer and, um, you know, uh, Jesse Winker and uh, Luke Mitchell, Boyd, yeah. Garrett Mitchell. I mean, a lot of those guys weren't even up on the team when uh, Josh Hader was traded. Mitchell even wasn't on the team yet. I think he came like a week later. So, um, you know, you're finding a lot of new guys that were not part of that process, that weren't, you know, devastated by that process. And I think that that new blood is, is kind of carrying through um, – this year, Owen Miller. I mean, there's a bunch of guys that are new to this team. So I, I think that that's, that, that's what I'm seeing um, besides just the talent level on the field. I think it's a, a change in the clubhouse. No, that's a, that's a fair point for sure. Um, and then a couple of the other um, new additions, new brewers, uh, Wilson Contreras, um, uh, sorry, William Contreras, uh, William Contreras, the catcher, obviously that came more from the Braves. Yeah. Actually, I think yeah. tied the record for, um, hitting the most games, consecutive games as a first time brewer with 10, I believe. Um, he tied, well, he record. tied second place. Yeah. He tied second place. Uh, Dickie oh, tied second. okay. Yeah. Dickie Thon still holding firm at number one at, uh, with 13 games, but yeah. Oh, okay. Tied That's for nice. second. Yeah. But still, I mean, yep. um, I saw Ron Billiard was on that list two at 10 games, but anyway, uh, <laughs> former favorite of mine, but no, I mean the Brian Anderson has started out of the gate really well. Um, but I think really, yep. From from my vantage point, I'm really thinking that um, the influx of youth uh, with the three rookies um, are all doing well in their early goings. Rhett Bryce Trang, as you mentioned, um, obviously Joy Weimer really seems like he's going to be a 
four line star player. And the same thing with Garrett Mitchell. Um, I mean, what those guys have been able to add to the team offensively, it's just something that we haven't, we did not get. Um, we saw, we've, the Brewer fans have seen the offense struggle for several years now, which is really frustrating with such a great pitching rotation and, and back of the bullpen in the last couple of years. And just that frustration, you know, those players, those fringe players that we added just were not uh, getting it done on offense. Uh, and, and, you know, having the having this influx of these rookies, I think is really invigorated. And a lot of times that does happen. Like, you know, when you have rookies come in, young hungry guys hungry for their big, first big league success, it kind of invigorates some of the veteran players as well. And I, and I think that's part of what we're seeing here um, so far in 2023. Yeah. And, you know, we, we knew that some of these guys uh, that came up through our system and had been, you know, ranked on our top 10 prospect lists and, and featured in some of Brandon's uh, prospect analyses that were, we're talented, you know, they've got the talent on the field. What I've actually been really impressed with, um, besides the offensive performance for a number of these guys, is their presence on the field and and their defense as well. I am incredibly impressed by Joey Weimer's uh, outfield play, his prowess in right field, his arm, the way that he plays balls. He acts like a veteran to me. Um, and even more so probably with Bryce Terang in the infield. I mean, the guy looks like he is absolutely ready to play the infield every day. Um, you know, people forget it's easy to forget because he's playing so well there, but he's not a natural second baseman. He came up as a shortstop. And the only reason he's not there is because we have Willie Adamas there. And so I, I am very impressed with their ability to, to, to step up right away. And there really is, has not been a huge learning curve, at least defensively. And I think that offensively they're, they're holding their own as well. So um, yeah, I, I, I've been, I've been really impressed by just their presence on the field. And I think some of the energy that they're bringing to the, both the field and the clubhouse too. Yeah, I, I agree with your assessment on both Trang and Weimer. And, and of course, Mitchell can hold his own in the outfield center fielder as yeah, well. Of course. I mean, Weimer yeah. in particular, like you said, he's got an arm similar to, to Hunter Renfro, who was manning that position last year for us. Uh, but his range in the outfield is like far exceeds uh, uh, yeah. Renfro's by like tenfold. Uh, and then he's similarly with the bat, with the power, but then he's got speed on top of it. I mean, you're talking about a, a true five tool player here. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's pretty exciting. And, and again, he's kind of flying under the radar as a prospect almost, in my opinion, uh, as a Brewers since he's been drafted, I think in like the fourth round. So uh, several years ago. So, I, yeah, I think he went for the University of Cincinnati and, and, and I knew that he had the power. But yeah, this de I did not expect that great defense out of him. He's been awesome. So, um so yeah. unfortunately, we started with the positives. Unfortunately, I have to get us to a few negatives here. And uh Unfortunately, it's injury related. Uh, let's start off with the first piece of news, and that was that um, Aaron Ashby had to have shoulder, shoulder surgery. Again, he hasn't pitched at all at the big league level this year. Um, but unfortunately, he did have to go under the knife and is likely to miss the entire 2023 season. There's small possibility he could come back for some September start or two, but I think that the Brewers will side on the air of caution and we won't see him in 2023. So that's a to me, that was a huge blow um, to this to the Brewers' 2023 chances. Uh, and since then, unfortunately, within the last week, then Brandon Woodruff also left um, his most yeah. recent start with an oblique strain, and it, it's a serious one. And it feels like he's going to be missing several months um, of the season. And you know, there's always a jeopardy they can't come back at all this year. So that's a, a huge blow. Number two. Um, whether or not we've the Brewers have, have uh, sustained a third huge blow to the rotation uh, for 2023 is still up in the air. But just last night, um, Corbin Burns left his start after five innings, um, and he, he, uh, his is a mild uh, a mild strain or tear. And they actually think that he may only miss one start, uh, if even that. Um, yeah. However. however um, there's a pot if this was any ma more major of a strain or tear he could be out for many many months as well so i think they dodged a bullet there as of right now um and hopefully that was you know hopefully that's good news uh because this team's rotation depth and i know we started coming this season i mean it was very strange because even when we say and signed wade miley we're like oh well that's a nice depth sign but do we really need him or you know there's nowhere to put him well at this point, he's like our number two or three starter after all these. Injuries. I was going to say, Craig, I, I think that our fans deserve for you to 
give Wade Miley some early credit at least uh, for the fishing performances that he's had in his first three outings. It's been absolutely incredible watching this guy work. You can see that, uh, and I'm not being facetious with that. You can see that he is, um, he's, he's a guy who obviously doesn't have the talent of a guy like Corbin Burns, obviously, or Brandon Woodruff, like in, ter- in terms of pure stuff. But I honestly think that mentally he's as sharp as anybody in, on the mound in, in the ways that he's creatively getting guys out and, and um, making sure to utilize the strength that he does have, uh, you know, to a degree that I think a lot of younger pitchers don't necessarily do. So I, I've actually been really enjoying watching Wade Miley out on the hill this year in all three of his, uh, his outings so far. I, again, very early, obviously, in the season, but been very enjoyable. And as our listeners know, when we first saw, signed uh, Wade Miley, he, he, he was entering the stage of his career where he was um, kind of, you know, looking like a journeyman back end rotation guy, and he was not too excited no. with his upside. And so therefore, I wasn't too happy to sign him. I, I guess I owe the guy an apology because he's now entered the phase of his career, which is kind of cool. And that's like super KD veteran who's had all the experience in the minors, majors, ups and downs, had plenty of failures that he has learned how to pitch with what he's got to work with. Um, and that's a, such a, another cool aspect of baseball, in my opinion, that, 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 you know, it just really depends on where you are and your, what part of your career and what part of your development as a player you are as to what your value is to a team. And, and again, some of these guys that eventually, you know, become really good pitchers are not all that great for the first couple of years of their career. And you, we've seen that with like Carbon Burns at first, and we've seen that, you know, there's growing pains to go through. And then, um, you know, there's, there are other guys that just figure out to work with what they've got. And, 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 you know, it's more of a cerebral po- approach to figure out how I can get hitters out, and to me, that's kind of one of the beauties and the poeticness of baseball um, is that is that yep. there's different people with different skill sets, and it's it's uh, it's very much a mind game as well. Um, and and I really feel that anyone with uh, enough talent to make it to the big leagues can be successful and carve themselves out a nice career in some fashion. And Wade Miley is a shining example of that, I think, at this point. So. Yeah. No, I I agree. And um, getting back to another point that you raised, our colleague. Uh, Adam McKelvey is reporting that it is uh, it is good news, mostly on the Corbin Burns injury front uh, as of today from the clubhouse in Seattle. It seems like things have um, kind of come out as the Brewers had hoped. It's still not 100% that Burns is going to make his next start, but he's not projected to miss uh, any significant amounts of time. Obviously, that could change if he were to you know strain something in a workout or push too hard, I guess. But um, as of right now, the, that's some good news being reported by our colleague, um, Adam McKelvey. Yeah, and I think that was smart for Burns to immediately motion when he felt a twinge or whatever, a tweak in his uh, side to come out of the game immediately um, to not, you know, jeopardize his um, his season any further. And I think that's a really smart move uh, by yeah. someone, you know, and a lot of guys, you know, try to act, you know, toughen things out like that and can sometimes do further damage. So I think sometimes you got to be looking long term instead of you know, trying to just gut your way through a game and at the major league level. So, I mean, I think that hopefully- Yeah, man, no, I totally agree. This is a Monday night game in Seattle, you know, in the first two, three weeks of the season. I, If this was game seven of the World Series, well, I'd say kind of, you know, you toughen it out at that point. But I, I agree. I, this is a, uh, I'm not going to say meaningless game, but it's a it's a, a game against a team that we never play in a different league um, in April on a weeknight. I, I, I think that we got what we could out of Burns. We got the victory either way last night. It was great. And um, yeah, let's just hope that he didn't, you know, do any further damage that uh, comes up later. Now, unfortunately, because of these injuries um, to Woodruff and Ashby, we have had to dip into our rotation um, depth uh, more than we would like to this early in the season. But I know that Colin Ray came up and pitched pretty well. Jansen Junk came up for a spot start, did not pitch that well. But again, small sample size, obviously. I, I, unfortunately, I think that we're going to have to really rely on these guys for that, that are there for depth. So it, it really, some of the keys to, I think the rest of this season is going to be the quality of our depth. And I think eight, we're going to really need Adrian Hauser to come back strong from the, from his IL stint and, and, and be a contributor in the rotation this, this year going forward. And we might even have to rely on some rookies. Uh, I'm really thinking of like Robert Gasser at this point, but I think J- Jansen Junk will also be back. Um, and this isn't his first year in the big leagues. He did pitch last year for the Angels and make uh, a handful of starts, but really he's a rookie as well. And I think he's going to have go through some growing pains, but um, I think we're going to need him to contribute at the major league level as well. So 
really those three guys I just mentioned, and unfortunately Brewer fans might not like to hear, but a combination of those guys, at least two of those guys are going to have to put positive innings for us at the major league level and the starting rotation for the, our year to be as successful as we'd like it to be. So really Hauser, Gasser, and Junk, I think are going to have to, and we may even have to, you know, what about like someone like Bryce Wilson? He might have to be a contributor. You know, he's he's been on the team as a long reliever so far, but yeah, I mean, he's got some uh, starting experience as well. I mean, we do have Jason Alexander that's on the aisle, but like again, I, I think that the Brewers went out purposely and tried to upgrade, um, you know, that depth. And even though he'd be there, if, if Jason Alexander is pitching in the rotation for Milwaukee Brewers at all this year, I'm, I'm gonna, unfortunately no offense to him, but feel that. The, the season is not going well. <laughs> so it's hope. Well, Craig, are, are you, uh, it, I don't, I'm sure you were watching our social media, but um, last night, uh, Scotty's intern, uh, Leticia, posted a great uh, a, a point that I've enjoyed. It said, uh, guessing we are going to see Zach Britton in a Brewers uniform sooner rather than later this season. Your thoughts, Brewers fans? What do you think of that? Well, I like Zach Britton. He's a left handed veteran pitcher who's got plenty of experience. Um, He's coming off injury and, you know, he's sitting out there and probably waiting for an opportunity. As our listeners know, I am, I guess, going into the season disappointed with how the Brewers constructed their bullpen uh, going into the season. Um, but, you know, with a, like to me, a signing of someone like Britain and maybe calling up from the minor league, someone like Jay Cousins, I think that our bullpen get, can get strengthened fairly quickly. But yeah. as it stands right now, I, I'm not sold that we have a great contenders uh, uh, quality bullpen, so to speak. So I think. Some yeah, although are... I will point out really quick, another couple of numbers. Well, first of all, that Britain rumor was um, was put out there by our colleague, John Heyman. But um, one of the things, if we're getting, you know, getting back to a little bit more on the positive to the you know, start to the season, the Brewers actually have the lowest ERA right now, bullpen ERA in Major League Baseball, 2.28 ERA. Um which is number one out of all 30 major league teams. All right. Well, once again, Brewers, I love it when they keep proving me wrong in the front office. So hopefully, you know, sign as many wide Wade Miley's and construct as many of these bullpens as you want, as long as it's working, I suppose. But it is early and it's kind of a small, small sample size, but um, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, so far, so good. And that, that really, you know, kind of speaks to the fact that how, how we're able to be 12 and five, 17 games into the season, uh, and so hopefully we can keep that up. Um, definitely. So um, whatever, yep. real quickly, and I know we could probably spend like an hour just on this subject, but let's just touch on it briefly. Um, while I'm throwing out tons of apologies in this episode, might as well throw out another one to major league baseball themselves. And that's, I really feel I was very much uh, thinking that the, a lot of the rule changes that the major league baseball is going to be making this year was overstepping what was necessary in my opinion uh but so far the early returns seem to really have changed the way the game is played obviously the game time has gone from about a three hour average down to about a two two hour and 40 minute average whether or not that's good or bad in my opinion someone who loves baseball i'm fine with the three hours but um i think what it has done is like it's made the quality of the play better uh i saw some line on <laughs> I, some some random uh, tweet or something on on the internet, something on the internet where someone said, "Hits are back, baby," <laughs> which I, just made me laugh. I don't even know, like look what I, hits went away. I mean, yeah, but the but it's I, I guess I think what the what that line uh, kind of meant was like like the play that was back in the seventies and eighties where there was a lot of slap hitters, yeah, and, and you know these shifts weren't gobbling up all potential hits, and that uh, and, you know and, and there, stolen bases are up. Too. I didn't mean to interrupt, Craig, but and stolen bases have been up because of the bigger bases, which which is the one thing I actually totally agreed with from the beginning was the bigger bases. That that's partially a safety issue, and I think it's partially um, you know doing doing things like you know giving that runner an extra six inches, you know, to to get to second base a little quicker on a stolen base attempt, which doesn't sound like a huge deal to to guys like you and me, but if you're a professional athlete, that extra six inches may make the difference in you being able to take a stab at stealing that base or not it's exciting to see that sort of game play back too i i'm a big fan of stolen bases and i think that that's um been a dynamic that's been really missing the last few years i noticed that the brewers have had the lowest and this isn't just a brewer's problem but the brewers are you know fitting into a larger trend that going into the season the last 10 years i think the brewers have had less complete games and less stolen bases than at any other point like 
those 10 years are the top 10 years for those statistics in team history. And that's just a, a general trend in the game with less stolen base attempts and less complete games. I think that you're going to see now uh, a lot more stolen base attempts and the stolen bases going up again, which is proven out in the first, you know, 12, 13 games here. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. And I, I think fans like that. I mean, I mean, as a whole, another element in the game and obviously since the, I'll just call it the money ball era started where, um, the philosophy was that, you know, you can't afford to make outs on the bases. Therefore, don't try to steal. Just try to, you know, take long, long like deep pitch at bats and then try to just get on base. Um, and, and I get that, but it is it does make for a more boring product for fans. I mean, more balls in play yeah. is just more action. And, and I think Major League Baseball figured that out. And if you look back to I think it was last the beginning of last season where. Okay, so you had uh, sticky stuff being used by pitchers. Um, you had the shifts being on almost every at bat, and you had um, um, you had possibly dead in balls or major league baseball messing with baseball. And all of a sudden, you looked at a back score two months in a season, and almost every single batter in the league was hitting under two forty. You know, like what is this? This is, and so that's why the hits are back, baby. Uh, line really made me laugh pretty hard because yeah. it really. It really is like, yeah, like people are putting the ball in play more and there's more action, there's more singles and stuff like that. And and so, and there's more just yeah. movement on the bases, which is fun. And obviously everyone loves home runs, but no one really likes walks and what and strikeouts and stuff like that. So I think the home runs aren't going away. The strikeouts from the pitchers are not going away, but it's being, it's being balanced out a little bit. And and to their credit, like, I, I think that the, the, the you know, last year looking at what was going on, they were like, oh crap, we got to do something. And I thought they maybe went a little bit too far, but so far the returns have been pretty good. And I think that uh, yeah. it's working for the most part. And I think that my, I thought people were going to be against the pitch clock. And when I say people, I thought fans and players both, uh, but I, it seems like they're both, uh, both uh, embracing it at this point. And I think it's It's here to stay. Well, to a point. Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, I, I still am not completely sold to be honest on either of these things, but um, I'm enjoying the season, but I always enjoy the season. So it's not really making a huge difference to me. I, I wish that the games uh, were a little longer, to be honest. Uh, Lena and I have been to a couple ones. Um, like down here, we were in line. It seemed like, it seemed like if you run into concessions, then you missed two innings now, though. You know, I think there's, you're, you're almost jeopardizing the, the desire of fans to want to go to games in some ways uh, on the flip side, because you want to get your money's worth out of, out of games as well so i'm not going to complain because it's you know i'm still going to go and it's been a, a great great and fun and exciting season i do wish that um the ship would have been beaten by hitters figuring out how to hit the ball where the fielders are not which seems to be hitting 101 like strategy because but i'm i'm someone who really enjoys strategy that's my favorite aspect of the game so um i yeah i i tend to i tend to think that you kind of just dumb down the strategic side of the game by these rules so i i don't think it's fair to say that 100 percent of people are on board because I, I despite loving the offense and the uptick on on actual hits and and seeing more you know balls into the gap um at least in the first couple of weeks i still think that it would have been even better if you would have lo looked at ways that you know offenses should look at ways to, to fix it themselves not waiting for some sort of rule i i think that there were a million different strategies that you could use to to beat a shift um that were not tried you know it would have it would have meant getting a little bit away from the three TO options type of mentality coming to the plate. But I think that there was a lot of things that could have been done, but um, it's like MLB had to do it for them basically to figure it out. So that's, that's the part that I don't like. No, and I agree a lot of your points. Like I'm not fully embracing these all. And uh, speaking of not really fully embracing either is the fact that uh, the brewers are the beer makers and their fans are the beer drinkers. And I really feel yeah. that they're not fully embracing um this pitch clock and all the other changes as well, because it's cutting down on, the, on their drinking time um, at the base. Well, not only that, Craig, but just today, right before we're taping here our sh uh, on our show, the Brewers also announced that not only they were the first team in baseball to announce that beer sales would be extended uh, into the eighth inning. And I've heard that they're actually considering just no limitation at all and just extending it for the full game. But they also now announced that the gates are going to open a half hour earlier. Uh, so the fans can get in and buy beer sooner. <laughs> so and, I mean, and they're not just... they're not actually changing the time though that you can go into the parking lot. So really, what they're doing is saying, yeah, we're not gonna we don't want you here tailgating. We want you inside the stadium drinking beer earlier. Um, so that's why and that's that's exactly what the strategy is, you know. And I, I'm no, glad for the, the workers. That, 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 you know, 
that gates so opening half hour it. earlier decision should have been made about 20 years ago when the Miller Park opened, in my opinion. But yeah. Oh yeah, I agree. I I think that it for a variety of reasons the right decision. I'm not disagreeing with that. Um, and you know, I I think that it's good. I think they should have BP on the field more. I think the fans enjoy that. The fans, unfortunately because of the later gate opening times across baseball and the brewers in particular, and I don't understand this in Milwaukee, but um, the brewers uh, always went, you know, first for BP. So then fans can never see the brewers hit unless they open up the gates earlier. So my hope is, is that, you know, for, for diehard baseball fans, they can go in and watch the early T, you know, the early batting practice and see their team actually hitting, which I think is, is awesome. I mean, that's, one of the ways I fell in love with the game was to, you know, go inside early for betting practice and get autographs and that kind of stuff. And I hope that they continue to take some fan friendly steps. Um, as I've complained about before, I hope that they take down, you know, the net pregame. I'm fine with them being up during the game for safety reasons. I don't think they're needed during, you know, infield practice. I think that's ridiculous um, just to make it easier for fans and players to interact. But, um, you know, there, there also have been these bottlenecks outside of Miller park. It seems like is the worst for, the security stuff and i i really think that that's way overblown too you know where it takes um 30 minutes to get inside the stadium and these lines are forever and it's, it's ridiculous so maybe this will help with that too so i i'm i'm in favor of it for a variety of reasons and you know hey beer vendors got to make a living too so i'm 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 all for it yeah and again in my mind like the average brewer fan is just like um you know, someone who drinks in the parking lot by their and tailgates and then stumbles into the game and enjoys whatever, you know, the game as much as they can. But in reality, I mean, if you look at, you know, families and young kids going to the game, which to me is, you know, the heart of baseball, um, you, you know, to be able to, anyone remembers as a, as a small boy, probably that's a fan or, or, or a young girl that coming into the stadium and, and getting close to that field where you can walk yeah. up to the field and watch bang practice and, and feel like you're, you know, your stars, yep. and your heroes are right there. You can see them. Um, that's different than, you know, coming in halfway through the game and sitting in nosebleed seats on the, in the terrace level and, and barely being able to see your players where you, you know, being there for batting practice and having guys sign for you and all that stuff. To me, that's some of the best oh, part yeah. of, of, of being a baseball for a kid. And, and, and it sucks that the Brewers wouldn't have been like more focusing on that in the past, but um, yeah, but I agree. And, and yet last year, Eve, the last year too, they even started checking tickets. Uh, so you, if you didn't have a first level ticket, you couldn't go down even during batting practice. I I'm fine with them doing that during games. They, you know, they have to protect their ability to sell seats at a certain price point. I get that. But I think that anyone should be allowed on the field level during batting practice to go get autographs and to get as close as you can. And, you know, I, I have no problem with doing that right up until like five minutes before game time, as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, yeah, quite I, think, frankly, I think they used to, they used to kick uh, everyone out of that level of uh, level. You didn't have tickets there. I think like 20 minutes or 25 minutes before game time or something, which I was still fine with. Cause they got to see most yeah. of batting practice. But I remember as a kid, that time when the ushers came through and like kind of sh- scurried everyone away, that was like a heartbreaking second. But you, but then, you know, then again, <laughs> once yeah. you got to the back of that section, you're like, well, I still get to see the rest of the baseball game now for my seats and, and go get some hot dogs yeah. and whatever. So, I mean, to me, but the, yeah. like, taking, taking that away from fans and kids is just, just silly to me. I mean, that's all, that's all part of the experience and the lure of baseball to me at least. So. Um, yeah, I agree. I haven't uh, tried, you know, this season in Milwaukee to, to get autographed or get down on the first level or anything without a, a ticket there. But I do think that, um, you know, I do know that last year there I, I heard that was being done and I saw it happen once to somebody and was not a fan of it. I know that um, my brother went to one of the weekend games up there and he said that they did that to him, but they were down by Adonacio seats. They had tickets. It was not in the first level. He, he, their, his kids are part of the terrace or I'm sorry, the Bernie's kids club. So I think they were terrace seats. And so they were down there getting autographs though. And they ended up having to go over. They didn't kick them out of the entire first level, but they kicked them away from the Brewers dugout. And so they went over and they got Cardinals autographs. I mean, I'm like, geez, really? <laughs> like, why would you, why would you encourage, you know, your your fans to go to the other team's side to get autographs, you know, and whatever. But um, anyway, it seems seems kind yeah, of yeah. No, that's I hope that they need to correct. So hopefully, maybe we can start a um, a little campaign to get that that fixed because I, yeah. I think that that's definitely important for. And they're talking about wanting to like, you know attract the next generation of fans and that's you're not doing yeah. it if that's what you're doing so uh, if you're only catering exactly. to your 
your your season seat holders who most likely aren't even showing up until game time anyways by kicking kids out of their area or out, that are standing in front of their seats i mean that's just silly to me uh so anyway. well and they're all diehard brewers fans just in this one example but they ended up getting kicked out of the brewery side and just going over to the cardinals and they got lars newbar and tyler o'neill and i think one, one other guy or something and it's like they're not going to become Cardinals fans or anything, but at the same time, like, come on, Brewers, like you should be encouraging these, this, you know, family with four kids to have fun and get autographs of their own, their own team. I mean, what the heck? Yeah, that's ridiculous. So hopefully it can get corrected, but anyway, so yeah. we got to wrap this up here, but um, yep. yeah, thanks again for joining all of our listeners and uh, really looking forward to the baseball season. Um, and again, I just re- even remembering back to all the years where the Brewers we didn't have all these, you know, playoff expectations every single year for the Brewers. And it was still really awesome to follow the team uh, between, between like 1988 or no, uh, we'll say 1993 and 2008, where there wasn't anything even close to playoff expectations. It was still awesome and fun to yeah. to, to uh, follow the team back then um, just because, you know, they're Milwaukee Brewers and you're, you're rooting for them every game uh, regardless yeah. of the expectations. And that was still a lot of fun, but I, I think that this team is still built to contend this year. And obviously we're showing it out of the gate with our 12 and five start. And I just hope that uh, health and luck will be on our side going forward. So. Yeah. Uh, same here, Craig. Uh, hey, really, really quick. Um, the Brewers, uh, as we're taping, are ending a series in Seattle here in the next day, but um, we do have a nine game homestand coming up against the Red Sox, Tigers and Angels. I'd like to get back a little bit to a, a, an old tradition. You want to, uh, predict our record really quick. I, I do have one note here from our anonymous source, uh, Tom Carter, Thomas J. Carter, and he says that the Brewers are going to be six and three on the homestand. Do you want to put out a guess for yourself, Craig? Um, I'm gonna have to go. With, I'm gonna have to agree with Tom there. I'm gonna go six and three as well. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna go. That's that's a good guess, actually. I. Um. Yeah, let's go. I'll go. I'll just go one game over 500. We'll say five wins um, just to be a little different, but it could, it could happen where they do exactly what you and run on the source Tom Carter say. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully yeah, our fans can make it out to the games. The weather here is starting to turn for the better. And uh, yeah, it's going to be awesome. So. Sounds great. Cool. All right, and we're hoping to get Scott and Chad back on the fold here soon for our fans. I know we keep getting requests for them, and uh, we're doing our best. So um, we'll get both back, both back in the fold here soon, hopefully, for our fans and uh, have, a, have a reunion of sorts. So, all right. That well, sounds great. It's got, it's got his email is uh, still Brook Review Podcast with an S at gmail.com. I'm sure he's checking in diligently. Continue to give us a follow, Brook Review One on Twitter, and uh, we will uh, look forward to answering some of your questions during our next taping. Sounds good. All right. Well, stay classy, Wisconsin, and go Brewers. Go Brewers. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Scotty. Do, 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 do.